the engine itself has a base footprint of uh, around three kilobytes. So uh, as long as you have at least this amount of memory, uh, the engine technically should work. Um, I would say that you still need at least a 32 or 64 to, to do something, uh, yeah, uh, which goes beyond a hello world, I guess. Um, and the engine itself was originally developed uh, from scratch by Samsung, and now it, it's, an, it's an open source project, and we have contributors from various different companies. It has been released under the Apache license 2.0, and uh, you, yeah, it's actively developed on GitHub. Um, usually, one of the one of the first questions uh, that come up when we talk about JavaScript is uh, why do we even want to run JavaScript on microcontrollers? So um, the our our idea here, or our motivation for doing this, is that we really want to enable, uh, yeah, web developers to to have. Um, a way of developing software for low-end devices with the, in the language they're used to, with the tools that they're used to. So um, not everyone wants to write C code, so for, for those people we want to, to give them an option, and especially if you consider how many JavaScript developers are out there and uh, how popular the language is, um, yeah, this is kind of what we're aiming for. And the, the other thing is that uh, if you think about it on the on in the microcontroller segment, the type of code that you run is typically not uh, heavily CPU bound. It's more focused on control tasks or things like calling a sensor, and that's certainly also. Um, uh, so, if you use a JavaScript engine there, then at least to a certain extent, you can also get away with the inherent performance overhead of the engine. And uh, the the overall goal here is to have. Um, by using JavaScript, working with a higher level language that you can develop your code faster or prototype um, uh, something faster and, and that way also ultimately increase your, your time to market or shorten your time to market. Another thing uh, um, interesting about uh, JavaScript is that it's, it's very easy to also um, load code dynamically over the network. So this is much harder to do if you're, if you're doing, uh, writing your software in C. And uh, also from a security perspective, um, you can, you still have between the code that you're executing and between the um, operating system, you still have your virtual machine in between. So you have some sort of sandboxing. Obviously that uh, uh, JavaScript engines uh, also have security bugs and uh, JavaScript certainly is no exception there. But um, yeah, it still it kind of gives you an option. Um, probably you shouldn't do this for really, uh, um, yeah, uh, crazy security stuff, but um, if you have um, constraints there which allow you to, to, to give, uh, give the, uh, the, the user some flexibility in uh, yeah, adding some scripting support to your uh, devices, then this, this definitely can be an option. Okay, so some more background on JavaScript. So the, the engine is about, um, uh, yeah, a little bit more than two years old now. The development started in June 2014, and then pretty much for the for the first year, all of the development happened behind closed doors until we open sourced it in uh, June last year. And then JavaScript had um, its first bigger milestone in in August last year when it finally passed 100% of the test suite to conformance test suite. And then we had, a, had another big step forward in January this year when we landed a, a completely rewritten uh, new compact bytecode implementation. So this was at the very core of the engine, uh, changing uh, a, a lot of the internals. And uh, that was a, was a big multi-month effort to, to get implemented and uh, we, we landed that earlier this year. And then for the last couple of months, we've been mostly spending our time on optimizing the engine, so implementing new uh, optimizations to reduce the memory consumption, to increase performance, and the, the end result of that essentially was uh, the JavaScript 1.0 release, which we uh, yeah, released in, in early September. And now we're kind of shifting our focus a little bit because we're, um, right now, 
the, the engine is, is quite competitive if you compare it against the other ones. So um, in terms of um, memory consumption and performance and code size, so now we're kind of shifting our um, focus more towards increasing the usability of JerryScript. So basically um, making it really easy to use for, for web developers um, to create good tooling around it. And I'll, I'll say a bit more about that later. A um, couple key characteristics of JerryScript. So the, the, the still the, the, the single most important optimization goal is to have a low memory footprint because that's the result we are most constrained with on the devices. And uh, the we are also doing only interpretation on the engine. So there's, there's just not enough not enough uh, memory available to do things like uh, just-in-time compilation. And uh, for to, to reduce the footprint, we have a very compact object representation. I'll also show a bit more about that later. And uh, for to, to reduce the, the overall memory footprint, we are using compressed pointers. So all the internal pointers on the heap are only 16-bit wide, even though we're typically executing on a 32-bit uh, architecture. And in terms of the uh, translation, uh, we are going straight from JavaScript sources to uh, bytes code, so there's no other intermediate representation in between, like an abstract simple tree. And uh, we're also doing this to, to uh, yeah, be very memory efficient. And uh, then at the very core of the engine is the, the compact bytecode implementation. So uh, that's, that's a very um, yeah, specific implementation, really optimized for having a, a footprint that is as low as possible. And I'll also show you some, some more details about that. Portability uh, is very important for JavaScript. So we designed the engine in a way that it's very portable. The, um, it's completely um, self-contained. You can build it in freestanding mode. So um, it, it has its own very small C library with just some of the essential functions that we need. And uh, if you want, you can also run it bare metal just fine. So that works. In terms of hardware support, uh, we support the um, STM32F4. So that was kind of the first uh, board we, we used with JerryScript and it's still kind of a, a reference platform for JerryScript. But we also support um, other devices like the Arduino 101 or um, the, the Freedom K64F board. And we have an, an experimental port to the ESP8266 as well. In terms of operating systems, we support NUTX, Zephyr, Embed OS, and Riot. So quite uh, good coverage there. And uh, on the we, you can run JavaScript on the desktop operating system just fine as well. So uh, that's useful if you want to use tools like Walgreens or if you want to debug an issue and have all the COM ports that you have on your, on your desktop system. Couple more things. So uh, JavaScript is, is written in C99. So that we uh, spend a great deal of uh, effort to keep that a pure C99 code base. Um, we are not using any GNU extensions. And uh, so technically, if as long as your compiler uh, is C99 compliant, it, uh, you should be able to, to just uh, uh, get successful build of JavaScript on your platform. And um, in terms of code size, we are at about 84,000 lines of code right now. And uh, the binary size, if you compile JavaScript for uh, Thumb2, then uh, we are at 156 kilobytes right now. And uh, that's built with GPT in LTO mode. So LTO stands for link time optimization. So essentially, um, the compiler can optimize across different compilation units as a whole program view. And uh, yeah, one important thing to mention is that the engine really implements uh, all of the ECMAScript 5.1 standards. So this is not just the subset. This is really the, the, the full. Um, yeah, full specification. And uh, as I said earlier, we are also passing the, the respective conformance test suite for that. So this really works. And then we also have a C API. So if you want to embed JavaScript into your own uh, C application, there we have an API for that. Um, 
that also works if you want to run, uh, uh, if you want to execute native code um, and, and call it from, from JavaScript directly. That also works through the C API. And then we have the bytecode snapshot feature. So that essentially allows you to pre-compile JavaScript source code into bytecode. And uh, the advantage here is that you can take the bytecode and you can offload it into Flash. So re you reduce the pressure on the main memory. And that's uh, especially useful if you have uh, a lot of JavaScript library code which is not changing very frequently. Um, and, and it also helps to reduce, because often the peak memory consumption actually happens during parsing. Um, this also helps to, um, to, to reduce that if parsing is your, um, uh, yeah, reaches your peak. And um, let's see, yeah, so this is just, uh, just a couple more uh, pieces of information about the STM32. Uh, STM32 F4. So this uh, hosts uh, an ARM chip, ARM microcontroller Cortex M4F, roughly 170 megahertz, and uh, it has 192 kilobytes of RAM. So this is already one of the larger microcontrollers. I think the, the current maximum that you can find on the market is around 256 kilobytes of RAM, and then after that, it really goes up to 8 or 32 megabytes already. So um, yeah, this is, this is already one of the bigger ones, and it uh, also has one megabyte of flash memory. So we've been also looking into the, um, so that's uh, another uh, interesting piece of hardware we've been, we've recently ported JavaScript to. So the work has not been upstreamed yet, but we're going to do that in the next couple of weeks. And uh, th this, this board is much more interesting for uh, if you really want to use it for some project because the SCM 32F4 board is an evaluation board. You don't really want to put that somewhere in your house uh, attached with some sensors and so on because it's just too big. But uh, the Photon board is, is really small um, and uh, it's, it's also very cheap. So it costs like $19 uh, if you buy it in the US. And uh, it has things like Wi-Fi already integrated. And in terms of hardware specs, it's a little bit uh, weaker than the STM32 F4, but still um, with 128 kilobytes of RAM and a an Cortex M3 is, is still doing quite well. And uh, you can run uh, yeah, even bigger stuff on that with JavaScript. Okay, so here's just a, a quick example of the C API, so you can, can, can get an idea of how this looks like. So this is just a very simple hello world here. So essentially we define a, a string here, and then uh, with a single function call, we can execute that, and, and the API will do all the work for us, set up the engine, and allocate the memory, and, and so on. So it's very easy to use if you just want to execute uh, um, some script. This is a slightly more involved example. So here, we're still doing just a hello world, but uh, we're doing it with two statements, and we are evaluating each of them individually. So uh, we need to do a little bit more work here. So first, we need to initialize the engine. Then uh, we eval the first line, um, do some memory management here, and then eval the second line, and then we have to clean up the engine. But still, so it's, it's, it's slightly more involved, but um, still it's, it's fairly low overhead API and uh, yeah, works quite well. Okay, so that's, that's the, the, the first look at JavaScript. So now to talk a little bit more about the, the internals of JavaScript. So this is just a, a picture of the high level um, design overview. Uh, the, the, the architecture of JavaScript. So we have a parser here, which takes the JavaScript sources, and then it produces the compact bytecode from that. And uh, there's also a literal storage. So this is kind of the, the system that, that handles all the literals. And uh, we, are, we obviously, since we care a lot about memory consumption, we, uh, we do things like making sure that we don't allocate the same literal uh, many times and things like that. So that's basically what the literal storage is, is helping with. And then we have kind of the runtime, which is, has the interpreter at its core, so that the interpreter is responsible for executing all the different uh, bytecode instructions. And then we have here the basically all, all the, 
the, there are runtime support that we need to implement the, the JavaScript uh, specification. And we have a garbage collector as well for all the memory management. OK. So um, Parser is, is heavily optimized for low memory consumption. And uh, our canonical test case is uh, yeah, running it on the 95 kilobytes of JavaScript sources of IoT.js. So IoT.js is, uh, is another open source project uh, which was started in, in Samsung, which essentially is a lightweight version of Node.js. So it kind of gives you all the yeah, APIs um, to make, make the whole package of JavaScript uh, and IoT.js useful. And um, parsing those 95 kilobytes of uh, sources consume about 41 kilobytes of memory. And uh, here we also have the, oh, it's dying, no. So uh, we ha here have the breakdown of, um, yeah, how much the individual parts consume. So you can see that around 13 kilobytes are just the pure bytecode. And then we have another 10 kilobytes of references to the literal storage. And uh, in the literal storage we have uh, or yeah, another 12 kilobytes of, of data, all, all of that are literals. And then we need another seven kilobytes for parser temporaries. So all of that, that memory is really just needed when, uh, during the parsing, once it has been parsed, all of the memory is, is free again. So you can see we are at about, yeah, 35 kilobyte in total. So we can, if you would pre-compile the 95 kilobytes, you would end up with uh, 35 kilobytes that you can store in, in flash. And uh, that would already reduce the, the peak memory consumption here. Uh, <clears throat> uh, I mentioned this earlier, so the bytecode is generated directly. We have no intermediate representation. We go straight from the, uh, from the sources to the bytecode. And the parser is a, is a standard handwritten a recursive descent parser. Uh, parser. And uh, one thing to note here is that we are not relying on, for the recursion, we're not relying on the compiler-generated runtime stack. Instead, we have our own uh, very compact, yeah, it's essentially just a byte array, which we use to, to track the, the um, yeah, recursion, because that's more compact and uh, consumes less memory. Compact bytecode, so that's essentially um, what a uh, typical instruction looks like, so we have uh, one or two bytes for the opcode of the instruction, and then we have a variable number of arguments. And uh, yeah, essentially it's a variable length bytecode. And uh, we have 306 opcodes defined right now, so that, that sounds a lot when you <laughs> hear it for the first time, but um, essentially a lot of the operations there are um, just variations of, of uh, always the same same operation. So as an example here, we have an, an opcode which, which uh, kind of handles this expression. So uh, where you have are referencing uh, a property. And uh, so we have an opcode for that. And to execute that opcode, we actually de decompress or, or decode the, the compact bytecode into a sequence of uh, multiple different atomic uh, instructions. And uh, that way we can, uh, by, by having the, these compact byte code instructions, we kind of, we get a better code density because we, we cover all the common constructs. We have other examples here like a, a method call with two arguments or um, an, uh, incrementing a variable. Um, by, by not having this, those things uh, already decomposed into the, the atomic, operations, we can save a lot of space. So the, um, the compact bytecode really um, was a, a big step up in terms of um, improved code density over our previous implementation, which kind of just had those things uh, directly. So uh, interpreter uh, is responsible for executing all the code. So it's uh, using both uh, a stack and registers. The stack is used for temporary values and uh, registers are used for local variables. And then what I mentioned earlier, uh, the, the interpreter decodes the compact bytecode and, and uh, yeah, translates it into a sequence of um, up to three 
atomic instructions, and then the interpreter has uh, the, the implementations for the, for the different atomic uh, opcodes and executes them. Compress pointers, uh, so uh, as I mentioned already, all our compress pointers are 16-bit wide. Um, they, we, we let them point to um, eight-byte aligned uh, objects. And uh, on a 32-bit system, this allows us to save half of the memory already. And uh, if you multiply the, the, the maximum number of um, um <coughs> what we have with U in 16, so what we can address with 16 bits, then we end up, because we are, our um, objects are eight byte aligned, we end up with a total heap space of half a megabyte. Um, we also have now, um, so that's usually enough for the, for the embedded devices. Uh, but it's for people who want to use JavaScript with something bigger, where they are already running into that uh, half a megabyte limit, you can also um, disable pointer compression, and then you get uh, access to the full 32-bit um, address space and can essentially have a um, four gigabyte heap just fine. Then uh, values, so JavaScript is a dynamically typed language, so the all of the values carry type information, and um, so the, the type is, is not associated with the variables, but uh, with the values instead. And uh, our, our standard um, representation for, for um, JavaScript values there is a 32-bit is a, a wide um, yeah, encoding. So we have a, a small 2-bit uh, type field here for the specific type of the, the um, value. So that can be a primitive value like uh, a Boolean or null or undefined, or it can be something more uh, uh, complex like a, a number, a string, or an object. And for the object, we essentially store a pointer here in the, the value field. And uh, on, since, since our um, objects are eight byte aligned, we can still store the pointer directly here. We don't have to use uh, pointer compression or anything, and that helps performance a bit. Strings, so string, string descriptor is eight bytes long. Um, it has a couple of fields, so we have a reference count. We have a type field, so we have uh, several different types of strings. Um, and we also have a hash to, uh, to optimize um, frequent uh, operations on the strings. And it also has a 32-bit value field. So, <coughs> One of, the, one of the types is just a regular um, string of characters. Um, then we have short strings, so that's where we store um, the, the string in the value field itself. And then we also have magic strings, so we have a mechanism where you can register frequently used strings uh, with the engine. And then you basically uh, don't have to create a string yourself anymore, you just pass around an index uh, of that table. And that, all, especially for large strings where you might generate a, a lot of copies, this also helps the memory consumption quite a bit. And uh, yeah. Um, number representation. So um, we have uh, the, the default in is, um, on, in ECMAScript is double precision. So uh, if you want, if you want to have an ECMAScript compliant implementation, you have to use double precision values for all the numbers. But we are also offering uh, a mode where we are using single precision instead. So obviously that's not ECMAScript compliant anymore, but uh, it's helpful for the people who really want to get uh, maximum performance uh, and uh, who are willing to trade off, uh, do the trade off there in terms of losing precision over um, gaining some performance. And this is especially interesting for, um, in the microcontroller segment, like with devices like the uh, Cortex M4F, where you have uh, native support for single precision, but uh, um, no native support for double precision. So um, yeah, that, that can make quite a performance difference if, if you have a, a microcontroller that has native support. Uh, objects, so uh, this is essentially what an object descriptor looks like. So again, we have a, a reference count here. Then we have uh, several compressed pointers here. 
So you can see the total size for the descriptor is just uh, 64, I oh know, uh, yeah, 64 um, bits. So we have two, uh, three uh, compressed pointers here. So one is uh, just pointing to the next object. So this, that's used by the garbage collector. Then we have a, a pointer to the property list. Um, so that, yeah, points to all the, all the properties that belong to the, to the object. And then uh, one thing to mention is that also in JavaScript, all functions are objects. So we have uh, object descriptors for the functions as well. Okay. Okay, so now let's have a look at some uh, performance numbers. So this is um, SunSpider benchmark looking at memory consumption. And we are comparing JavaScript 1.0 versus duct tape 1.5.1. So duct tape is another uh, open source lightweight JavaScript engine. It's a little bit older than JavaScript. Um, and uh, it's, so essentially here we see the results for all the different uh, yeah, benchmarks that are part of the SunSpider benchmark suite. And uh, the, the red line essentially is duct tape and the blue line is JavaScript. And as you can see, if you, if you uh, look across the chart, you can see that basically JavaScript is outperforming duct tape on all of the benchmarks. So um, typically at it's consuming uh, at least uh, yeah, half of what duct tape consumes. Um, there are some extreme cases here where really just uh, JavaScript con consumes 20 times less memory than duct tape. Which is, which is already, um, I mean, also duct tape is optimized for a, a low memory footprint. It might not be as optimized for the really low end microcontrollers, so, but some work has also started in that direction. So uh, probably will, duct tape will, will also shrink a little bit here. And you can see that it kind of has at least 97, I think, is the lowest. So um, there are probably also some options you can use to, to cut the duct tape footprint a bit further, but this is really just the default configuration on, uh, of both engines. Okay, so performance-wise, um, we have a um, similar picture here. Um, there's JavaScript is better than duct tape in pretty much all of them, except one here where duct tape is slightly faster. And uh, yeah, typically it's, it's also two times faster than, than what duct tape, um, yeah. Duct tape takes about yeah, twice as long for, for most of the benchmarks here. Okay, so that's, that's performance. Now I want to show you a, a, a quick demo. So um, this is uh, um, basically an implementation of the classic Pong game. So we are running this on two devices. So we have a Raspberry Pi and an STM32F4. And, uh, each of the devices has an LED matrix connected via I squared C. And the idea is that we have a single shared um, yeah, display and each of the devices controls half of it. The devices are connected via Ethernet and uh, essentially we have a simple client server system where the, the server is running on the STM32 on top of JerryScript and uh, IoT.js. So all of this is implemented as a Node.js module and uh, we run it on the Linux side, on the Raspberry Pi, we actually run it on top of V8. And uh, yeah, the logic for the game runs here, and the human player is uh, using the USB keypad to do all the input. And I have a um, short video of that that I can show you right now. Okay, let's see. So here's the, here's the demo, and you can see here's the Raspberry Pi, stm 3204 Each of them has an LED matrix connected here. Uh, their networking connection is, is here, and uh, here we have the human player just, uh, and you can see here the, the pedal on the right is controlled by the, S, by the microcontroller. So that's all JavaScript running now on the, on the microcontroller, um, yeah. And you, you see it's very smooth actually. The ball essentially passes over the network between the devices and uh, you, you don't really notice any, 
any um, yeah lag or okay so that's the pong demo then okay let's see then I have a, another demo so this is the the Jerry script six low pen demo so this is a demo we we just developed and uh, it's essentially very similar to the Pong demo, except that it also supports Tetris, and it, it's really a multiplayer, so there's no uh, AI involved. And uh, the, the key difference is that we are running, instead of the STM32F4, we're running it on a, on a Photon board, and uh, we're running it on top of Riot rather than NUTX. And that gives us the ability to have, uh, instead of having an Ethernet connection, we now have a six low pan connection between the two devices. So six low pan is IPv6 on top of the 802.15.4 low power wireless standard. So essentially you can, the, the photon, you can just run this as a, as a battery powered device. And uh, it, because it's using all the, all the low power protocols, it um, <coughs> won't drain your battery immediately. So this demo, I, I don't have any video of that, but we will show the demo in the um, technical showcase session on Wednesday. So uh, if you drop by our table there, you get a chance to, to see it live in action and, and you can try it yourself. Um, so that's the six low pen demo. Future work, um, we have a couple more ideas of what we want to do in terms of optimization. So we've done a lot of optimization work already but um, there are still a couple more things that we want to do. But the, the main, uh, our main focus for the next year will be to um, work on things like debug support. So um, JavaScript doesn't have a debugger right now, so that's definitely something we want to add. And uh, also add some more tooling around JavaScript, like a memory profiler, because um, the developer really needs some assistance there, because you can't just uh, write JavaScript as you want on if you're targeting uh, low-end devices like that. You need to be a bit more conscious about the, the alloc memory allocation patterns. So creating some tooling which helps with that is also on our uh, roadmap. And uh, we're also thinking about implementing uh, some of the uh, ES6 features, but we haven't really decided on, on what to focus on there specifically. Uh, and obviously, uh, there are new, new boards being released all the time, so making sure we support the latest uh, boards is also something we're constantly working on. Okay, so that in summary, um, I mean, JavaScript really shows that, it's, that the approach is working, that you can run JavaScript on really small microcontrollers. So um, JavaScript is getting fairly mature now, um, Pebble is using it in production already, so they, they run it on their um, Pebble smartwatches. So that has been deployed already to, to hundreds of thousands of devices, and they've just released an SDK um, for third-party developers so they can develop watch faces for the Pebble watches in JavaScript rather than C. Um, so it, it definitely um, yeah, is, uh, is getting uh, more and more uh, widespread. And uh, yeah, using JavaScript really helps you to do to prototype something faster on the on the low-end device. And uh, JavaScript has a, a small but active community. And uh, if you want to find out more about it, um, please have a look at JavaScript.net. It's not working. Yeah, it's working. And uh, yeah, we're always looking for for bug reports, feedback. If you uh, give it a try and run into any issues. Just let us know, and we'll try to fix it. So that's it from my side. Thank you very much. <clears throat> so I think we still have time for questions. Any questions? Yes. OK. okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so we have um, we just recently added support that um, you can kind of have a, a JavaScript global context. So previously, 
Um, there were a lot of global variables and so on. So we have kind of isolated all of that into a single object. So now you can uh, indeed run uh, several, yeah, well, I'm not sure if that's called instances, but uh, uh, we certainly have some abilities to manage the memory there, yeah. So the, um, uh, the other need that you have is mm -hmm. a way to, to amp or to block the maximum execution time of the program. Yeah. Yeah, uh, we don't have it right now. Um, I think someone else was also requesting that just recently on, on GitHub. Um, but that's certainly something that can be in implemented very easily. So um, you could add an additional hook in the interpreter and then specify some limit there. And I mean, there's already some overhead involved. So if you carry another counter there, probably you won't really notice a big performance impact. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. Do you have any timeline on the, uh, the debugging and the memory profiling? Uh, uh, <coughs> research, like when? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, I, I, we were still in the planning phases for the next year, but that's something we, we really want to focus on on the next year. Um, I, I would guess it will take at least, my, I don't know, I would say six months to get something that's, uh, that's uh, usable. Uh, maybe maybe we'll be done earlier, but uh, um, yeah, basically next year is all about that. Yeah. Any further questions? Yes. Is there a latest integer type? Um, no, we so we really just have the um, yeah the JavaScript number type, which is uh, floating point by default. We use uh, integers internally because a lot of um, a lot of the calculations are obviously just integer calculations, so we optimize that a little bit. Um, but uh, we don't expose any additional in integer types to the user. So that all happens transparently in the engine itself. So working with a lot of hardware types. Yeah. Uh, 8-bit, 16-bit, 24-bit, Big Andean. Yeah. Having some good integer operations. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's a good point, yeah. yeah. Any other questions? If you want to, uh, you said you've got like 300 plus top tens. Mm -hmm. uh, is there an API for adding new top code? Or um, <coughs> JavaScript objects? So, I mean, we, we're not exposing it to the user, but certainly um, as a developer, you could just modify the engine, and if you see certain patterns in your code, um, then you can just add that. It's, I mean, essentially adding a new opcode is just kind of uh, decomposing it into the existing atomic operations. So um, it's fairly easy to, to do, I would say. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. Yeah, yeah. So, so RTJS, yeah, exactly. So, because essentially what JavaScript provides is just implementation of the JavaScript engine. That's also very important. But then you need to have something on top of that, right, for accessing, I don't know, GPIO and, and your, your network protocols and so on. So, IoT.js um, has been yeah, aiming to be a, a yeah, lightweight version of Node.js to provide some basic stuff for that. Um, but the project itself has not been uh, very active this year, so um, there was a, lo was a lot of work last year, but this year um, it has been uh, progressing quite slowly. But we are also in the process of um, yeah, reviving it and, and doing more work on that again. If you look at the repository, you can see that there already has been uh, a couple of commits uh, in the last couple of months. So uh, that's, that's also something we are going to look into um, to uh, yeah, have a framework on top of JavaScript which, which helps the user. And that's also part of the whole usability aspect to make it easy for the developers. But there's certainly still some work uh, left to do there. Yeah. Okay. Any further questions? Okay, I guess we're done then. Thanks again. Yeah.